think that's it now. Okay, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for what our ears have heard. We thank you, Lord, for the words of what you're doing, Lord, in the west of, of Belfast. And Lord, we see a city and a society like all around us that is so broken, Lord, with so many people who are lost. And Lord, they're choosing suicide as an escape. And yet it is no escape for them. And loving Father, we know you care for these people and you care for those right across the land. And Lord, we would ask tonight that in this gathering, you would come and touch our hearts, that you would change us and bring us into conformity to your mind and will, that we could receive your burden and know your heart and do your will. So Lord, we do ask that you will bless and Lord, that you will just continue with us by your spirit. We pray that you will bless your word and I ask Lord for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Please put a wall of protection around us, Lord, and grant a real deep sense of your divine presence. And may we hear your voice. I take authority over everything that would stop or interfere with the voice of God speaking into men and women's spirit. And I pray that they will hear your voice, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Some of you will notice that Esther's not here. She's been unwell today. We were hoping to have her, but God willing, she'll be here uh, with us next week. And again, do, uh, do rem remember other or remind others to come along if you can for next week for that special meeting. We really want you to come and to bring others as well. Now we're going to turn together, please, to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. This is a very wonderful chapter in the Bible. We don't have time to read it all or to speak on it all, but we're going to take several truths from it, and I hope that God will use them to speak into all our hearts. Isaiah chapter 58, commencing at verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Where have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife, and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast as I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that to ye break every yoke. Is it not to he heal or deal thy bread to the hungry? that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. And thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity, 
And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noonday. The Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make thy bones fat. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his word. Let's bow for a word of prayer just again together. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would anoint your word just now. We pray, Lord, that you would really enable us to receive your word. I ask for an anointing that breaks the yoke. And I pray that tonight someone or some ones will become fascinated with God fascinated with his will, and be willing for the first time ever to really do his will. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject I've entitled, From Ritual to Reality. From Ritual to Reality. Here the Lord is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and what's clear from the entire passage is that God has something he desires. We could take so much time going through each verse and identify, and there's rich meaning in every verse, but time doesn't permit that. Other than to say what's very clear from the chapter is that God wants fellowship. God desires these people who the prophet is speaking to, God wants them to know him. God wants the obstacles that are creating problems regarding this fellowship, God wants those problems to be addressed. So as God uses his prophet to speak to the people of Israel, it is not at all that God is against them. It is not that God is coming with a whip to hurt them. But quite the contrary, God in his heart is longing for deep intimacy and fellowship with these people. And God has not changed. Our great creator, the maker of heaven and earth, wants fellowship with us. And that fellowship in some lives is rich and deep. And in some lives it is shallow and almost non-existent. We make a great emphasis, and rightly so, in our land of the preaching of the cross and the gospel where men and women require the new birth. Thank God for that. But the emphasis often isn't clear enough in the need for deep intimacy and relationship, development of that relationship with God. And that is a real problem today. And I want you to take note that in verse 4, that these people were engaging in fasting, and I'm going to paraphrase some of these verses from another translation. So if you think I'm uh, using something you don't understand. It's a paraphrase from another translation, and it sometimes helps us just to get clearly what God is saying. And in verse 4 in the latter part, it says, Fasting as you do today will not cause your voice to be heard on high. In other words, God is saying, I have a problem in hearing you. I am not hearing you. You are my children by covenant. 
You are the nation of Israel. This is my prophet. But I would long that I could hear your voice and that we could have intimacy like what was in the Garden of Eden when God and Adam walked together. But God said, that's not happening. I wonder if our eyes were open to the spirit realm. I wonder if God lifted the lid and permitted us to see as the old prophet when he said to the young prophet on that occasion, Lord, open his eyes. I wonder would we be amazed, shocked, delighted? I wonder what the impact would be if we could see what our prayer life was like. How powerful or ineffective or non-existent it may be. And so that's the motivation of God. And I want you to know that God has not come to condemn you. God does not come to make you feel guilty. God does not come to oppress you. But rather, God wants you to experience freedom in him. Now, many people mistake freedom for license. You see, the, ro the road of walking with God is a spirit-filled road. And the two dangers, the two, uh, the two great gulfs at either side that create danger for the Christian walking the road with God is that one is license, where the person said, I'm under grace and I can do whatever I like. God has saved me, I'm safe, I'm redeemed, and I live whatever way I like. It's no big issue. That's license. That's wrong. The other one is falling into the, the trough of legalism, where a person becomes so legalistic in their views that they believe that we can attain to righteousness and maintain righteousness purely by keeping rules. And so both are dangerous, and they're the great problem for any Christian who wants to walk with God, and they have to be kept an eye on all the time. Otherwise, you slip off the road of a life of fullness and the love and grace of God in your life. And so God's motive was to find fellowship with his people. And so what does God do? Well, this has always been God's way. God in the Old Testament knew, and in church history, God chooses instruments to communicate. Now, I know there are many places today in the world where God is directly intervening through dreams, through supernatural instances where God is breaking into people's lives. I'm aware of that, and God is God, and who am I or you to contradict or to in any way say, well, God can't do that. But one of the chief ways and the primary way that God uses to communicate is through preaching, through preaching. And so God has his servant, Isaiah, and Isaiah has had a long time of preparation. He has been through God's mill himself. And as he has been through God's mill, he's in a prepared state to now declare what God wants to be declared. Very often when our lives are not totally committed to the Lord and we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, then what happens is the message becomes contaminated. We contaminate the message with our own selves. That's always a problem. But God, as he filters the child of God, as he cleanses, as he works in our hearts, then purity and obedience and submission to God enables God to give the message clearer and let us relate it clearer so that as John the Baptist said, it's not I but him. Let him increase and let me decrease. So what does the prophet declare? He declares, the Lord says through him, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people, their transgression unto the house of Jacob, their sins. This is God's approach to getting intimacy back with his people. This is God's approach. The first thing that God brings out to his servant, the prophet, is he said, you're going to need volume. Volume. 
He said, you're going to have to cry aloud. Now, why would God say to his servant, cry aloud? Well, for a very simple reason. There's many other voices that are crying for our attention. There are many other voices that are laying their claim to our lives and to our future. But the Lord, through the prophet, says, I want you to increase the volume. And what this actually means is to cry from your throat or from your stomach. I want you to project your voice. I don't want you to hold back. I want you to communicate in a very unerring and clear way to the people what I want to say to them. In this verse, the Lord says you have to lift your voice up like a trumpet. Now, those who have a little knowledge of the Jewish people will know that when they were founded as a people and as the 12 tribes developed, they communicated via trumpets. And there were many trumpets, and there were various trumpet sounds that were sounded in Israel for different reasons. There was the call for battle. There was various callings. And actually, whenever Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, he said, if, if the trumpets sound an uncertain sound, who shall assemble for battle? In other words, he said, if the note going out isn't clear, nobody will know what to do. And so there's always a need for clarity from the prophet or from the servant of God. Volume. But then he says, cry aloud and spare not. That means courage. Because the prophet will never be popular. If you come into a society that hates God, hates light, hates the Bible, hates truth, and you start declaring the Bible and the truth and the Word of God, you are going to raise enemies. And so he says, I want you to increase the volume, to communicate the truth, and I want you to be courageous. And it takes courage to stand for the Lord. It doesn't take courage to go with the world. It doesn't take courage to even belong to the average church. It doesn't take great courage to be involved in a lot of activities even inside the church. But when God asks you to do something that you know is not going to be embraced or accepted, and you have heard it from God, you need courage from God to do that. In the early church, they were always praying, Lord, give us boldness. Give us courage. Help us to do this, Lord. Help us to say this, Lord. Help us to preach this, Lord. But not only was there volume and courage, there was very much clarity. God said to them, he said, this is what I want you to cry aloud. This is why I want you to have courage, because what I'm asking you to do is to preach against sin. I want you not only, and I have actually misquoted, and I apologize for that. Some of you might not have noticed that. But he didn't actually say to preach against sin. He said, preach against the sins of the people. The sins. In other words, what God is saying to his servant, the prophet, is he said, there are sins that are being committed by the people of God. They need to be named. Those sins need to be very specifically and clearly identified. No vagueness. No generalities. No slipping or some we fall. No dealing with it lightly. But the Lord says to the people through his prophet, he said, I want you to come and cry aloud and to declare or show to my people their sins or their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Now, what he's saying is, I want you to paint a picture for them. And God says, I know what they're at. I know how they're living. 
I know what they're saying. And so God says, I am going to give to you what's going on. I'm going to reveal to you as my spokesman what's secretly going on in their lives and their homes, and I'm going to get you to name it because it has to come out to the light. Clarity. Generalities are no use. One old preacher said, put the hay down where the sheep can reach it. In other words, don't be speaking a language or don't be working with the congregation in a way that's not clear, that they can't get a hold of it, that they can't grasp it, that they can't lay it to heart. Make it clear. That's what God tells his servant to do. One preacher said the grand point in preaching is to break the hard heart and to heal the broken one. And that's why a preacher needs the Holy Spirit, because it's only the Holy Spirit through the Word of God can break the hard heart and at the same time heal the broken heart. So God says, I want you to declare sin. Now, what was the problem that was mentioned here? What is the issue or issues that needs to be brought out before the people? Well, we could cover it in one word, and that is deception. We have the people of God. We have people who belong to the Lord by covenant, but they are utterly deceived. The Bible tells us that one of the great traits of Satan and his kingdom is that of deception. The Bible says that in the last days that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. The Bible says that the devil deceiveth the whole world. He's a wonderful deceiver. And again, this is another area where the saints And I hope this will become very clear for all of us as we look at this, how that the saints can be completely ignorant of deception and yet be so orthodox in their understanding and apparent obedience to the Bible. You see, these people were not entirely godless. These people attended the temple daily. These people had a fascination and a deep interest in the Hebrew language and of the Scripture. They dearly desired the Scriptures to be unlocked to them. They wanted to hear what God had to say about His truth. These were not pagans. These were not people who proclaimed any form of antagonism against God. Quite the contrary. To all appearance from the outside, these are people who are following the Lord. They have doctrinal accuracy. No doubt they involved themselves in conversation with noting the sins of other people and noticing the groups that were not in their group, how wrong they were. But their problem was that they were more interested in ritual than relationship. Fellowship with God was not a high priority. How can you tell in the life of a Christian or in a church whether fellowship with God is a priority? Can you actually look at a church and find out if this church really is interested in fellowship with God? You can. Well, where would you find out? The prayer meeting. The prayer meeting. Don't just go to the prayer meeting to see how many are there, but sit in the prayer meeting and find out whether you can even sense God's presence. And you'll determine whether that church 
is into fellowship with God or whether they're more into ritual. How do you do it on a personal level? Same thing. Remove all the excess activity and involvement in evangelical work and love for the Scripture and preaching and teaching and all that activity and strip it all away and bear the soul to God and put that man or woman alone in the presence of God and see how they do. And you will find whether that person has a love for fellowship with God or whether they are lost in ritual. My dear friends, a comparatively small number of Christians are interested in fellowship with God. The vast majority are taken up with ritual activity, an interest in Bible studies, more information, but will not bear it to heart. The Lord said that their problem was essentially that they were actors. That was the problem. Hypocrites, that's where we get the word from, actors. We find them th throughout the church. You find them in the days of the Lord Jesus when Judas, who was with the wonderful Savior, and beheld his miracles, and yet despite all, could still betray him for money. His love of money betrayed him. We find Ananias in the early church in Acts chapter 4, 5. And Ananias is there. Well, Ananias is apparently a believer. I'm assuming he is. And Ananias comes in and he well, he's in a wonderful church where the power of God is present and the gift and operation of the Holy Spirit is working powerfully. Wonderful things are happening. The church is being added to daily. People are being supernaturally converted. Jews are coming to the Lord in their masses. Wonderful times. People of God can't stay apart. They're every day in their own homes. They're meeting in homes for fellowship, for breaking of bread. They just love the Lord. Now, Ananias is in it all. But there's people who begin to sell their possessions and give possessions for, for the Lord's work. And Ananias and his wife decide, well, you know, it's nice to see those people getting a wee bit of praise, isn't it? Look at the, that one gave his property and, you know, he's, somebody said something nice. It's nice to get a wee bit of praise, isn't it? So Ananias and Sapphira, they go up and say, well, we have given... And it looks the part. But they're not interested in fellowship with God. They're interested in being actors. They're acting. They're playing a game. But it's a dangerous game. Because what happens is Peter takes note by the Holy Spirit what's going on. And he's smitten dead. And his wife's smitten dead. Because what did they do? They lied to the Holy Ghost. You see, revival, when we talk of it, and outpourings of the Holy Spirit are wonderful. But they're equally terrible. Because God does wonderful things for people, and he does terrible things. Because all these things come out during periods of revival. Secret sin is drawn out. During the revival in the 1940s in China, they said that some of the people were taken by the authorities, Christians, and they were tortured. And as they were tortured, or people who were unsealed, rather, they were tortured and they wouldn't disclose any information, even though the Chinese did everything they could to pull and torture and tear them to pieces. Couldn't get any information out of them. Yet, when the revival came, those same people that would not disclose anything, when the Holy Spirit smote them, when God met them, they ran to confess everything that they had done. They couldn't keep it. They couldn't hide anymore because they were dealing with God. They were dealing with God. And so there are always those who are involved and engage in religious diligence and who are under deception. Diotrephes, we listen, I often think of John. John the apostle was such a nice person. I love John. 
He's so kind. He's so compassionate. He's not harsh. There's, he's just a lovely person, John. And John wouldn't have been the type that was too critical or straight. You know, he would have been kind in the way he would have said anything negative. And, and there's this guy in the church called Diotrephes. And John, this is the way he approaches it as he puts it in his letter. He says, Diotrephes loves the preeminence. He loves front step. He loves honor. He loves the big name. You see, my friend, Diotrephes wasn't interested in fellowship with God. Because if you're interested in fellowship with God, you don't give a monkey's whether you're at the front or the back. You don't care. As long as you can go into a closet and meet God, that's all you care about. Because if God wants you at the front, he'll have you at the front. If God wants you at the back, you'll be glad to be at the back. And anything other than that is the flesh. It's flesh. And flesh all too often is just pouring out of the pulpit. It just runs like a reservoir from pulpits. Flesh, flesh, flesh. Well, there's deception. This deception is enforced by the religious diligence. That's what enforces it. That's the deception. Because they're so religious. They're so taken up with this. That's the deception. Now it's exposed. Thank God there's an exposure. I praise God for the Holy Spirit. I praise God for the gift of repentance. I praise God for the light of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, friends, exposure came in verse 6. It says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and let the oppressed go free, that they may break their enslaving yoke? In verse 5, we read these words. The Lord said, is, is such a fast as yours what I have chosen? You see, there were things that were going wrong. Look at verse 3. Why have we fasted, they say? You see, these people are engaging in all this activity. I mean, there's religious diligence. They have to get five out of five for that. If they were here today, they go to their local denomination. They're all into it. They're loyal to it. They'll attend it. But again, if you stripe, strip it all away and put them in the face of God and set them alone with God, they're going to be silent. They're going to be bored. They're going to have nothing to say because God's not speaking to them. And they're not spending any time with God. And that's what's happening here. And this is what they say. Why have we fasted? They say. And you do not see it. Why is it that there's nothing happening? Why is it we are doing all our thing and you're not doing your thing? See? Problem. And the problem is that God the Holy Spirit is now going to bring exposure because of failure. Failure is fantastic. Failure is the best thing that could happen in your Christian life. Wish to God there were more failures. I'm praying. I pray every day. God, please bring a multitude of failures into Lisbon. Please, Lord, Christians that are at this caper and they're going on and on and they've been at it for donkey's years. Lord, please bring them to failure. Please, Lord, by the Holy Ghost, show them they're going nowhere. Show them that they're getting nowhere. Show them that they're on a routine, that they're just spinning the wheel like a, little, like a little mouse or something and they're getting nowhere. Please, Lord, do that. It's not going to happen to everybody. There's people like it. And they'll stay there to the day they die. And you have to let them do that. It's their choice. You've just got to decide, Lord, which, which camp am I in? It's your decision. But the Holy Ghost exposes failure. There's nothing happening. They're not getting any light from God. They're not getting any direction from God. God isn't really speaking that clear. Well... They have been fasting, they have been afflicting themselves, and God stays silent. So, thank God they asked the question. That's the good news. They asked the question, Lord, why is this not happening? Why are we engaged in all this, Lord, and there's no reward, there's no fruit? Why? And what does the answer come? Well, thank God the prophet speaks. And the prophet fulfills what God has told him. He says, I'm going to tell you. You ready for it? 
God says, I'm going to tell you what's wrong. Okay, you're fasting. Yes, we are. God says, I see you are. You're going without food. You're going to the temple area. You're listening to the Bible being preached. I see that, God. I see you're doing all that. He said, but listen, you're abusing your workers. You're not treating people right. God says, I see that as well. You see, according to the law, whenever they fasted, not only were they to go to the temple and fast before God, but they were to permit all their workers, slaves, anybody who was for them, they had to have the freedom to go to God as well. But these guys weren't letting that happen because it was going to affect pounds, shillings, and pence. The old God mammon, the old idol of the rich, that which is killing the church in Ulster, Killing Western Europe. Materialism. It's killing us. God says that's the problem. And he said your understanding of fasting and spiritual exercise is totally different, God says, to mine. You think you're doing it right. And God says, I can see that you're doing it wrong. You say, but I'm doing the best I can. But God said, you didn't ever seek me to find out personally from me what I had to say. I love the Bereans in the book of Acts. Do you know what the Bible says? Whenever Paul preached or Peter or whoever, they searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. They didn't take anything, just what anybody said. They really sought God about it. Is that right, God? So the prophet explains to them that they're abuse. He says later on, he said, this is what's happening. You're coming for your fasting. And he said, your heart is full of strife. And conflict. Now, some commentators said this is what was happening. He said they were actually going for their fasting, but they had been without food, perhaps without drink. And he said, you know, they're just like people who who are trying this religious diligence, but as a result, they're so frustrated because they want food and they're doing this as a ritual. And he said, their anger, they're just like people like steam ready to blow out of them. And he said, whenever they're meeting others who are of the same attitude and whose only heart is after money and after materialism, he says they they blow up and what they do is at the temple or outside it, they end up shouting at each other and cursing each other and even punching each other. Listen, friends. I can think of several churches, several over the years that I have heard evangelical churches where coats were taken off in the churches where men were ready to fight. How do you think Almighty God thinks about that. You see, the prophet said that's what's happening. You're all involved in this conflict, and it's to do with yourself. Turn with me to the book of of, uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm going to read again from this paraphrase. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, However, brethren, I could not talk to you as to spiritual children or spiritual Christians, but as to non-spiritual men of the flesh, whom the carnal nature predominates, as mere infants in the new life in Christ, unable even to talk. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not strong enough to be ready for it. Even yet, you are not strong enough. And here's the sign of of them being non-spiritual. Verse 3, for ye are still unspiritual, having the nature of the flesh under the control of ordinary impulses. For as long as there is envying, jealousy, wrangling, Factions, that's little groups. Ye are not not spiritual, but ye are behaving yourselves after a human standard and like mere unsaved men. He said, there's the sign that yous are not spiritual. He says, you're all into little groups and conflicts. And yous have got your little groups that you stand with and so on and so forth. And he said, that's the evidence. 
They were using usury. In other words, they were charging for money they had lent out and taking the amount from that. And they were leaving people impoverished by their interest that they were charging. Wonder how the banks will all do at the judgment. Some of these big bankers. Do you ever wonder how those boys will do? You think of the number of people that committed suicide. People that had legitimate businesses and their business went and committed suicide. Hundreds of them. Do you, you ever wonder how those old bankers will do at the judge and stand at the bar? God shows them what they're responsible for. If we thought more about what we did, I can tell you we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't do it. God says usury and abuse. And then in verse 9, I want you to notice this. The Lord said, you will call and I will answer you. If you take away from you the midst, from the midst of you yokes of oppression. All forms of putting burdens or weights on people. Putting people down in any way. God says, if you start to lift those things off people. He says, things will start to happen in your life. Start to lift things off people. And he said, I don't want you just to lift them off. But he said in the latter part of verse 9, he said, the finger pointed. Pointing the finger. That speaks of accusing people and condemning people. God says, if you stop that, if you stop that, I want fellowship with you. But he says, you're always pointing your finger at everybody. You're always throwing your finger out. He's done this. She's done that. And you have all the facts, supposedly, to do that. And I have done it. And it's things that have to be repented of. Because, as I've said before, your tongue will get you into places that your hands and feet will never get you out of. There's nothing as wicked as the tongue. It's set on fire by hell, the Bible says. Out of it we bless men and curse men. The Bible says these things ought not to be so. And God says, this is stopping fellowship with me. I would love you to come into my presence so that we could have time together. But God says that can't happen because you're always pointing your finger. You're pointing your finger. And then finally, he says, not only are you pointing your finger, but he says, you're blaming and accusing everyone. He said, every form of words out of your mouth is false, harsh, unjust. All this type of talking, God says, this is really grieving my heart. And the prophet brings it out. Well, you say, well, what was the solution then as we close? Well, the solution was very simple. Repentance. Repentance. What did God desire the people of God to do? He desired them what every true generation of saints have ever done that wanted fellowship with God. A great internal heart searching. Time before God alone. When we would permit Almighty God to show us things in our life, things in our home, things in our relationships that are not right. My friend, if you have the courage to ask Almighty God to show you, Lord, what is the problem? Why are you not real to me? Why have I not got this desire for close intimacy with you? If you give God time, the Holy Spirit will show you. He will show you. And friends, whenever we do that, one preacher, I think it was, I think it was uh, Booth perhaps, I'm not sure, but he said very interestingly regarding true repentance for the child of God, he said, you must fall out with sin if you would ever fall in with God. The Bible says if we confess our sins, that's Christians, God will forgive. God will cleanse. I have learned so much and I'm learning in my own life concerning this whole area of personal repentance. I had reason to pray with a man recently. What he had done is he had 
had a, decided he was a Christian and he felt this other person was involved in the occult to some degree, and they were. And what he decided to do was to take a run at them and, and shout something at them. And it was, I can't remember, but he decided to be the brave man and run at this person who was involved in the occult to annoy them, to aggravate them, and he, he did that just out of his own initiative. And when he came for prayer, while we were praying for him, he said to me, he said, I can see the face of that man. I can see the face of that man who was engaged in the occult. And I says, well, we're going to pray that the Lord will remove him, whatever influence he may have over your life now, we're going to ask God to take him away. But when we prayed, nothing happened. And he said, he's just standing there. He's not moving. You've prayed and there's nothing happening. I said to him, did you, whenever you had an, this incident with this man, did God tell you to go and say these things to this guy? Or did you try to be macho man? Oh, he said, I was macho man. I just ran in and decided I'll give you a big, a big word. And I said, well, I want you to repent for that. I want you to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry for moving in the power and energy of the flesh to deal with something that was really outside my remit. And I'm sorry. And so he did it. Just prayed that simple prayer. And immediately afterwards, when we prayed, he looked up and he said he ran away. What does that show me by way of simple illustration? That shows me, my friend, we need to be in an attitude of repentance toward God. An attitude of repentance. So that God, by his Holy Spirit, can show us. That was what the great saints always done. That's how they got intimacy with God. They spent time alone with God, and they asked God to show them anything that didn't please or agree, agree to his will. And God would show them, and they would get intimate with God. And then they would get, you know what would happen? It's, it's said of, a, his name will come to me. He was great, a great preacher from England. And he went out, he, he said before God really met with him and he began a, a real a, a life of encounter with God, he used to say, how long can I pray? Or how long, sorry, how long must I pray? He did it because he had to do it. How long do I have to do this to get this thing over with? How long must I pray? God met him. And God so worked in that man's life, so wrought with sin in his life, so brought him into intimacy with God. Do you know what happened? That was what he said afterwards. How long can I? He loved the presence of God. He, was a great, he became a great evangelist all across the world. That's what's needed. That's the key. Anything other than that is failure. I don't care what you do. Anything short of that is failure. Intimacy with God is the key. What's the outcome as we close? Well, the Lord said, let me read it to you as I conclude. In Isaiah chapter 58. Verse 8. Then shall your light break forth like the morning. What does God promise? God says light. What does light speak of? Light speaks of a new dawn. That's what it means. A new dawn. You ever go out on a beautiful morning and the light's just starting to come through? Mm, something brand new. I say, God says, when you deal with that, when you do that, God says, whenever you're willing to really seek me and really open your heart to me and become really earnest with me, God says from his throne, this is what will happen. This is God's cast iron guarantee. God says you'll get a new day. He said light will start to spring up in your life that you never knew. It's all to do primarily with your spiritual life. God says you'll get light you never had before. You'll get insights you never had before. God says it'll be brand new. You looking for anything new? And he said your health will spring forth. Strength, vitality. God says, I'll give you enabling. 
He said, your righteousness, that means your, your walk with God that has now developed and grown from giving, from lifting the weights off people, from repenting for sin in your life. God says that that lifestyle will begin to spring forth. And what will happen is, God says, as you walk in that light, do you know what I'll do? God says, I'll open the doors for you. And he says, I'll begin to make a path for you that you didn't know. I'll begin to do it. He said, I'll do it. And not only that will I lead a new path and an opening for you, but he said, I'll be your real reward. He said, I'll stand behind you. I'll be at your back. He said, I'll do all that for you. Do you know what this tells me? This tells me that God wants this. That's the good news. This is what God wants. And the simple thing is, do you want it? That's it. John Bunyan said these words. We will never crave to be filled until we're convinced that we are empty. Do you think you're empty? Or maybe tonight the world still has your attention. Maybe materialism. Maybe human relationships. I don't know. But maybe you're not empty yet. But you'll only crave him whenever you know you're empty. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you, Lord, for your grace in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for your desire to come and speak to us. And we pray that you will bless your truth to our hearts. And I ask, Lord, if there's any in here tonight that you are handling, that you are speaking to, that you would really help them, Lord, to open their lives so wide to you, to embrace your will and your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.